Good day. I am Derek Hogan with North Georgia Technical College here at our campus in Clarksville, Georgia. I have a little something I want y'all to look at today, and we're going to take a look at it and see if we can determine if this part is a CNC part or a manual part. In this case right here, there's ways to do it both ways. So there's advantages to do it both ways. Let's step inside and see what we got. As you walk in the doors of the building, one of the first things you'll notice is we have a lot of windows. They put a lot of windows in because they wanted people to be able to see what we did. It's kind of interesting as a machinist and a CNC machinist, one of the things is I find a lot of times people don't really know what CNC machinists do. So it's good for people to be able to see inside and to see what we actually do. At some point in the future, I want to show you around and show you some of the stuff that we all have and some of the stuff that we do. But for today, we're going to talk about this part here that can be either a CNC part or a manual part. Okay, here is the model of the piece. Now, what features of this would make this a CNC part? Well, wood, you can kind of see these chamfers here. These chamfers are not an easy thing to cut, an easy thing to handle. Well, they can be done using manual equipment. It's just a little bit more difficult to do so. Also, the basic shape of it. You know, how we're going to cut these in, cuts into right here. It can be done. I've done pieces like this manually before. And this is like a project I do with my, my mill T students as a way to get them to think about how to make the pieces. Well, I read this one earlier on the CNC machine and I came up with the final product that looks like this right here. I did hold it using a dovetail. Uh, we have a nice little vise here. It's got a dovetail in it, which has um, worked out really well, made it really secure, which allowed me to really be kind of aggressive with my cuts. This right here, I had to worry about it coming off because considering I would not have a huge amount of material to clamp on. So what I'm going to do is take a look at the same part and see how we can do it. In case you're wondering, start to start from design to program to final product was about an hour and a half on this. So if I'm doing one of these, if I can do it quicker manually in less than an hour and a half, I can save myself some money. If I'm doing two, the swing advantage will swing definitely over to the CNC. But for a one piece, I'll have to see how much of an advantage the CNC actually has.
So what I gotta do here is I gotta put this piece into the thing. I've already faced one side of it off. Now I gotta get the other side. I need to make sure this piece is flat, square. So what I'm gonna do is take and put some parallels in here behind the vice shawls. I usually put one of two of my vice shawls basically parallel to the floor like this right here to allow, make it a little bit easier to do that. That way I only have to hold one parallel in place while I do this. And always remember to take the parallels out. If you don't take the parallels out, they will get launched across the room. They will not stay in here on this with this running. Okay. Once I get this tightened down, I can then take the parallels out. And I should have this running relatively true. Once I get this mounted in square, it comes time to face it off. So I'm going to take it down to the dimension it calls for here. Uh, normally, I would leave a little extra material on here for paper decking it off. But I'm not going to have a way to machine the top surface of this once I get it clamped. So I'm going to turn the spindle on. Whatever. This calls for a 750 dimension. So I'm going to go ahead and mic this right here and see where I'm at with this. So right now I'm at 870 right there. So actually, no, 895. Um, so that will give me the amount I need to take off, which in this case right here will be 140 more thousandths. One thing to note, uh, if you notice my chips started off being a nice little relatively controlled piece, they're now beginning to get a little bit more out of control here. I didn't video that last cut here, but this will give you an idea of what chips look like right here. This is not an ideal circumstance right here. So what I want to do with this right here is I want to go about changing this to um, changing my feed and or my speed to work this. I'm running at 10 thousandths per revolution right now at about 1200 RPM. I'm going to drop my speed down to 800 RPM and I'm going to change my feed rate to about 12 thousandths per revolution. So once that change is done, I'm good to go. Now let's video this cut and see how this one looks. As you can see, my chips are still kind of turning off of stringy. This is part of the problem about doing aluminum. Aluminum can be very tricky to get good chips. So what I'm going to do to help that out is I'm going to make another change. I'm going to go up a little bit more my feed. I'm going to go up from 12 to 14 thousandths per revolution. This is after the change.
you probably see how that last cut went, some of, the, some of the problems with machining aluminum. In this case, aluminum doesn't always cut consistently. It went from cutting fine with the first cut to not cutting as good with the second cut. What could cause that? Well, the, the second cut was 10 thousandths shallower because that's going to be uh, taking 50 thousandths off the cut before that, taking 40 off that there, which is going to get me closer and let me have a little bit left for my finishing pass. Another thing that could change is as the material heats up, sometimes these, sometimes how it responds to a cut actually goes about changing also. This is a telescopy gauge. Uh, so what are the ways you can check a hole diameter? What I want to do with this right here is I want to compress it. So this is the clamp on the back. Compress it. And then lock it back in place. I want to put it here at a slight angle. Expand it out. Back in there. There we go. And now I want to lock this down while holding it at a slight angle. I then want to rock it through the hole. Just let it find the high spot. Now I have a measurement on the hole here. So what I would do is then take a micrometer. And the micrometer will allow me to be able to determine what size this actually measures. So right now I am measuring. It's right here using my micrometer and I have a reading of 1.464 so it gets to be about 36 thousandths away from my inch and a half diameter on this bore. So what I would do next is dial it by 36 thousandths. 36 for aluminum is um, an acceptable amount to take for a roughing slash or finishing pass. It really kind of comes down to whether or not you're trying to get the material off in a hurry or try to get a good finish. The one thing I have found with aluminum, a lot of times you need a little bit of cut depth of cut to actually get the chips to actually break properly. So a lot of times we go a little bit heavier even on my, on my finishing passes with aluminum. Just put it on the correct way. Over. Take the telescopy gauge, put it back in the hole again, set it at an angle, lock down, rotate through till you find the high spot. Take your micrometer, get your reading. You see, I have one point. Five, five, one and a half there. So I'm a little bit oversized on this right here. Uh, by one and a half thousandths. Once again, this would depend upon the tolerance as to whether or not it was acceptable or not. Um, what I could have done better there is I should have taken a second reading to verify my number here, which I'm going to do right now to verify that number. So once again, rock it down through. Find your high spot. Take your micrometer. I'm taking a reading off camera here. This right here is a little bit closer to 1.5. Telescopic gauges are pretty accurate if done properly. 
But once again, it's one of those things that you're talking about, you know, plus or minus about a thousandth for one of these right here. I've done work a little bit more precise than that with them before, but you have to take multiple readings and verify that you're actually getting a consistent reading. One more say before I take this out of the lathe. I need to cut the chamfer on it. It calls for a 70 thousandths chamfer at 45 degrees. So what I'm going to do is set my compound on my machine to 45 degrees, which you should be able to see right down here. So my compound is set to 45. I'm going to use my compound to go about making this cut here. Now what I would do here is I need to touch off two places to have an idea where I'm at. One is the internal diameter and the other one is the face. I'm going to zero out after I touch off on the face. The face is going to be the first touch off I'm going to do. Lightly touch off the face here. Zero out. Now, after lightly touch it off with the face, but I just go back using my compound to go by making this cut here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move back to my zero point on my the face here, and I'm gonna have zeroed out my X also. That's gonna allow me to be able to control my chamfer dimension here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move to double my chamfer dimension because this machine is now currently set to read off the diameter. So I got my digital readout right here. I'm going to dial this to about 50,000 for the first time here. My diameter. And then I'm going to go about cutting it. Dollar over another 50. goes about cutting the chaffer on the inside of that bore. So I've taken this piece as far as we can take it on the lathe. Now I have a second video coming that's going to show some of the mill work to go about completing this piece here and turning this piece from what would be normally considered a CNC part into a part that can be made on manual equipment. Now we'll say it's not as efficient to do it but if you don't have CNC equipment sometimes you got to do what you have to do.